I, I know you heard the, the story already that uh, which just rocked my world and blessed me so much that from South Africa we were blessed to help us with the new computer. That was just a wonderful blessing. I, I believe we will get the rest of it, but um, that was the, the major catalyst to say from a, literally the other side of the world, we're with you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. Well, for today, let's see if I can do this. Ah, it works. The title of this message is Fully Awake, Unveiling the Mind of Christ. This is part one. I don't know exactly when part two is going to be out yet, but uh, we'll get there. But being spiritually awake, according to the Apostle John, is waking and walking in the same light that Christ emanates, according to 1 John 1, 7. This is quite different than what religion teaches. Religion, doesn't matter which kind, although it can clearly include Christian religiosity. Religion teaches that we must believe in God to experience him. In many cases, believing in something we're not aware of can actually be nothing more than a self-absorbed construct. And it can be something entire groups believe to be true, but even then, it's not really real. <clears throat> Christ actually taught something quite reverse. When we awake to God, we won't just believe, we will know deeply. This is the New Testament's definition of pistis, which is faith. In our modern culture, we talk about faith and belief as just simply regardless of whether I can see, feel, or experience, I'm just going to believe something. Well, faith is not believing in what you don't see, actually. Faith is actually opening the inner eyes and seeing. The difference is simply what vehicle we are using to see. Make sense? Well, with that in mind, throughout the Gospels, Jesus reiterated to us to awaken. Or to say simply, if not to awake, he would say, stay awake. The apostles used the same expression as well. And here are some of those statements. I just want to read through some of these for a minute. Matthew 26, 38. Then he said, this sorrow is crushing my life out. Stay here. Keep vigil with me or stay here and be awake. In Matthew 26, 40 through 41, he says, So he said to Peter, Can't any of you stay awake with me for just one hour? Stay awake and pray you won't be tested. How about this one? Luke 12, 37. Servants are fortunate if their master finds them awake and ready when he comes. I promise you that he will get ready and have his servants sit down so he can serve them. John 11, 11. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. How about this in Acts 12, 7. And the angel of the Lord stood over him, and a light shone in all the building. And he pricked his side and awakened him and said to him, Arise instantly, and the change fell from his hands. And then Ephesians 5.14, For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So, you know, you hear these, and there are more, there are others, okay? But you hear these, and you think, hmm. So what is this? The idea of awakening or being awake is an expression to disclose, now listen, the inner unveiling and recognition of our true spiritual existence in union with Christ and God. In other words, it's describing our transmigration from a state of spiritual death to spiritual life. 
if you're new to this idea, this is not something we can just study, read about, or possess information. Rather, it comes through a process of inner transformation through understanding and awareness. When Jesus arrived on the scene, the Pharisees and the people of Israel were looking for an external kingdom. They were looking for their savior deliverer to come and overthrow Rome, replace their rule with a Davidic king, and wreak vengeance on Israel's enemies. Think of all the scriptures that seem to say that. And think of how many Christians today seem to think the same thing about the return of Christ. But Jesus changed the whole focus. He taught that the kingdom wasn't external, but internal. Let's look at this verse. You know it. Luke 17, 20 through 21. Now when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, See here or see there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. Consider, this is echoed by the Apostle Luke in the Acts of the Apostles and the Apostle Paul in Romans, Colossians, and the writer of Hebrews, the Apostle John in both his Gospel and his Epistles. And even if we read the book of Revelation within the context in which it was written, that is exactly what it tells us. The kingdom doesn't come with observation. So wait a minute, what are you talking about? What are you saying? The kingdom of God requires a complete change of inner awareness. From the egoistic lower world of flesh and external associations to an inner world, an inner never-ending world called the kingdom of God. Jesus said this, Truly I tell you emphatically, unless a person is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Consider that. Consider those words right now. Unless a person is born from above, a different state, a different aspect, a different point of view, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, I was just mentioning about the book of Revelation. I want you to consider this verse. Behold, he comes with the clouds. All eyes will see him, even those that pierced him. And all the tribes of the Lamb will dance about him. Yes and amen. Now, interesting, most translations, this is the Aramaic, most translations say, and all the tribes of the land will mourn. Wow. Wow. Now, I'm not going to argue that there may be a mourning in a, in, a, in a moment of the realization of Christ, even within us, because we're the ones who put him on the cross. I get that. But even the scripture says that when there's mourning, Joy comes. Joy comes in the morning. Just saying that. Amen. Right, so, good. So, you know, think, think this through then for a minute. If truly I tell you emphatically, unless a person is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And then when he comes, we're going to see, even those who pierced him, is this really about Jesus coming back with some great vengeance? Or is it about a massive awakening to who Christ is? I think that's a real key point here. So I, I wanted to bring that out uh, before we went back to those other scriptures because we're talking about an awakening, something that is transcendent of this physical world. And what many times happens is this other part of what we call the self, which we'll talk about in detail in a little bit, what we call the self fabricates something else. So let's look at those verses again. For example, Ephesians 5.14, For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Consider this. Raising from the dead in this context is awaking internally. It's a awake sleeper and arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. 
Think of how think that through for me. So contextually, going all the way back even to the book of Genesis, death has nothing to do with the physical issues in our discussion. He's impressing upon us to arise from a spiritual sleep so the shining of Christ could be realized. How about this verse? And the angel of the Lord stood over them, and a light shone in all the building, and he pricked his side and waked him and said to him, Arise instantly, and the chains fell from his hands. Consider, Luke, who wrote Acts, says that it wasn't until Peter awoke from a sleep into an already existing light that the chains fell off. We really have to awake for the chains to fall off. Yes, yes, yes. I'm going to suggest to you, we're trying to get people unchained that haven't awoken yet. And that's not their fault. I'll explain that in a little bit as well. How about this verse? Jesus says in John 11, right, after saying these things, he said to them, oh, friend Lazarus, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awake him. He's come to awaken us from sleep. While many take this literally, which is fine, until we awaken inwardly, we won't recognize an outward resurrection. How about this one? Now this one says something that's mind-bending if you really read this. And, and let the word speak to you. How many times we talk about serving God going into the ministry, doing the work of God. But hear what Jesus says. Servants are fortunate if their master finds them awake and ready when he comes. Now, we would stop there and think, yeah, they're ready, so we're ready to serve, we're ready to go to work, right? But that's not what it says. It says, I promise you that he will get ready and have his servants sit down so he can serve them. That's a total reversal. Wait a minute, I'm supposed to be serving God and God's serving me? Jesus is changing the inner picture of what humanity has known as a God. Rather than a God who has his constituents, servants, and minions serve him, he desires to serve us. That's mind-blowing, but it is throughout the biblical story. From Abraham to Jesus himself. In Genesis 14, it says that God Most High bowed his knee. Baruch Avraham. Baruch Avraham. We, we translate that, blessed are you, Abraham. Well, that word Baruch, Barak, is the knee. God's bowing his knee. Who's serving who here? You say, well, I don't know about that. But we see Jesus do the identical thing when he laid aside his garments, took a towel, poured water in a basin, and bowed down and washed the disciples' feet. Yeah. It's a very different picture of God. Up until this point, the children of Israel had the mindset that their Savior is going to come, destroy the Roman rule, liberate them, f destroy the other enemies of their lives, sit and rule, and they're going to worship the majesty of this amazing God who demands their worthy worship. <clears throat> and instead, Jesus shows up with a God that says, okay, we're not doing any of that. We'll just leave Rome where it is for a minute. Because the kingdom I'm bringing has a far greater reach than over violently overthrowing the government. Because my kingdom transcends this world and its system. And just to give you a hint of this God 
is he wants you to be humble enough to allow him to serve you. How about Matthew? So he said to Peter, can any of you stay awake with me for just one hour? Stay awake and pray you won't be tested. I thought this was interesting. In Matthew, we have a real clue as to when temptation and testing comes. It comes when we fall asleep. It didn't say when testing comes, stay awake and pray. Jesus was definitely not staying, saying, think about this. This I thought was kind of funny. He says, you know, he says, could you stay awake with me for one hour? He's talking about praying, right? Jesus wasn't saying, pray with me that Judas and the Romans can't find us and give up trying to incarcerate me and liberate us. Rather, the difficulty is coming. The issue is how are we going to respond to it? From a place of being awake or as if one who sleeps? More on that later. That's powerful stuff. Now listen to this with another set of ears. Rather than just hearing Jesus in his humanness, being so fatigued, feeling despair, which I'm sure what it was true, there was something the in, in the entire time he was requesting if the disciples had a different awareness. Then he said, this sorrow is crushing my life out. Stay here. Keep awake. Keep the vigil with me. How about when we are awake to Christ, he is ever present. But when we become weary within our inner life, we anguish and crush the life of Christ out of ourselves. Not literally, like we're pushing it out, but we lose its awareness because of another mindset that's present. Like Peter in the prison, the light is shining, but we sleep in chains. The thing is because of the egoic, lower, fleshly system we created when we chose in the garden the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And there are times we seem to walk in the light and then get weary and fall asleep. Well, I'm going to suggest to you that as true awakening occurs, we don't really fall back asleep in that area of awakening. What happens many times is we start to recognize the conflict of something else. And this is really what I wanted to focus in on today. This awakening from death to life can be best described if we take a moment to explore ourselves. Spiritual death, according to Genesis, in the conversation between God and Adam, and then the woman and the serpent in the garden, is where several things happen. Now, if you've been around Oasis for a while, you know this, but just in case you're, you're turning in uh, for the first time, we're now going to talk briefly about standing before that tree of the knowledge of good and evil with the serpent and discovering this dialogue. In short, three basic things happen. Number one, the man and the woman who is created in the image of God take on the belief that they're not like God enough, even though they already were. I'm not like God enough. I need something more that this tree is going to offer me so I can finally become like God. Subtlety, God's been holding out on me. He said I was his image, but I really wasn't. Number two is the false belief that knowing good and evil will make us more like God or accepted by God. Knowing good and evil is that false belief that that is what's going to make me like God. And then number three, by transforming our desire to receive and give, which means be a reflection of God or reveal the image of God from within, into a desire to receive from myself alone. We commonly call it the ego, the serpent, in that respect. Thus, the imaging of the serpent, the ego, we begin to emulate. Understand, not one of these things really can happen independently of the other. 
they are interconnected. In another context, the, ser the serpent really is not a negative. But to understand ourselves, we must grasp, I think, this aspect. And traditionally, we call this the fall. Now, as far as Christian religiosity is concerned, we've put God, Christ, the serpent, and the devil all into a good and evil box. God is good, devil is bad. God rescues, devil attacks. And then we believe God is within us somehow, and we still live these dynamics without being fully awake to that reality. And instead, in somewhere in us, when we think about it, God is, and the devil are still seen as external forces that are either for us or against us. Now, this can actually be a misconception, maybe even a delusion of reality. This is why I call this, in the book of Melchizedek, the death sleep. Let's explore. This is an interesting verse for 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Listen to Paul's words. Examine yourselves to see whether you are living in the faith. So now we're going to determine whether we're living in the faith. Living in the faith doesn't necessarily mean now I'm believing God for my finances. Right, right, right. And I'm confessing and speaking and believing standing on a verse of scripture. That may not necessarily be this definition of living in the faith. What does it say? Examine yourselves to see whether you are living in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Wow. Unless indeed you fail to meet the test. Think that through now. L living in the faith is the recognition that the Christ lives and emanates through me. Yeah. <laughs> I fail the test when I fail to scrutinize that as a reality. I have to come awake to this reality. To awaken, we must realize that our current state of affairs is that it Maybe a trans transaction? No. Let's try the word transformation. No. How about transmigration? Has to happen in our point of view. You see, unfortunately, transaction for many of us is how we do religion. It's transactional. I give my money. God's happy. Blesses me back. Not I give because that's our nature. And any type of financial return or some kind of blessing that comes is a, becomes a mere response right. of creation because I'm exempl exemplifying the nature of God. Make sense? Yes. But religion becomes transactionary. I got a sacrifice to get my crops. All those kinds of things. But this is not, and when I say transformation is a really good word, but transformation has also the suggestion at times that I'm changing from one being into another. Okay, which kind of goes back to, well, I'm not really like God enough now, but I'm becoming like. Well, that's technically... There is a truth to the concept of transformation in the most Greco-Roman world, the, the Greek world, the Roman world at the time when you said metamorphosis. Um, it was actually becoming from within what you always were. The caterpillar is, was always the butterfly. Transmigration, I like that word because it now is talking about changing my point of view from below to above. Failing the test of faith here that Paul is talking about may still be believing the doctrine that Christ is in you, but not awakening to that living reality. Please note, this awakening is like when we awake in the morning. Before you actually open your eyes, there's a process your body goes through. It's all about the hypothalamus in the brain uh, that engages, and believe it or not, what it is doing, and I, I can't imagine this, it has like a built-in timer. 
That's why if your alarm go clock goes off before that alarm clock goes off, so to speak, you have that yucky feeling. But when you usually, if you wake up through that timer, many times we can feel refreshed. Now here's the, the key issue. If that's the case, consider that our awakening has to occur at the right time. Now I'm not talking about time chronologically. I'm talking about this awakening happening because a certain, I've got walked through a certain process. And you've heard me say this before, say it again. There's that old adage, when the student is ready, the teacher will come. Okay, the challenge, I think, with true spirituality is, especially in contrast to our religiosity, is because what we've done in the evangelical world, said it before, say it again, is we have the attitude not when the student is ready, the teacher will come. Our attitude is ready and not, here I come. Ready or not, here I come. Don't you want to get saved? You're going to burn in hell forever. Jesus loves you, even though he created hell to send you there if you don't love him back. You know, all those kind of things. You know, what, all the, and and we're, we're like an alarm clock <clears throat> trying to wake up people that really are not ready. What we need to do is be led of the Spirit to those who are ready. Yeah, but I, how do you have a church of 2,000 people like that? Well, maybe you don't. Maybe you don't. <laughs> there may be a real truth to this. It brings us to this. What most would call the flesh or the fallen nature is actually something a bit more dynamic than just a body or something that happened, you know, thousands of years ago. Or as one denomination calls it, original sin. There's something a bit more dynamic, and this is what I want to unpack for you a little bit more today. You know, if you think about it, when you take on the mindset that the fall happened long time ago, and really it's Adam and Eve's fault, that makes me a victim, and I'm really not responsible, and Jesus is coming to rescue me, rescue me from what they did. Rather, it's the development of our true spiritual self we're addressing here, which of course is in Christ and in our limitless Father. The serpentine self, self-centeredness, or the ego, gets its identity from something that's really not you. See, so remember, the fall is something we were all there. We are Adam. And when the fall occurred, this world occurred. Now, we look at it from a negative. Right now, what I want to do is kind of shift that a little bit. And let's not make it negative or positive. Let's just take it from that space and understand it. Because our propensity is still to put it in a good and evil box, which is the tree itself. It's the fall itself. So I'm, it's kind of like saying, I'm free while I'm standing in prison. And then looking at the prison bars and what we really start doing then is we want to make it good. So now we start hanging curtains, right? Maybe get some new furniture, but we're still in the prison. The prison of good and evil, right and wrong. Ultimately, it's that egoistic, self-centered point of view of good and evil, right and wrong. So how does the serpent, the, that egoistic serpent within us gets its identity. 
Now, if you've been through Genesis Factor, you've got some of this, but I want to look at it from another angle today. We get our identity actually from something that's really not us, egoistically. We identify with the external. For example, I identify with my home. I identify with my car. I identify with my appearance. What pleases my ego, my music, my attire. But this only works if there's a contrast. Hear me out. This only works if there's a contrast, if there's a difference. To put it another way, if I can identify something opposite to which I choose, then I can identify myself. That's why it's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Let me give you an example. If I identify with a particular style of clothing, hair, and attitude, back in the late 70s, early 80s, we called this the punk rock look. But understand, this was an identity that was to contrast this. This was a statement against the establishment, which basically looked like a bunch of, in particular, white businessmen in business suits standing in front of a house with an American flag behind their, 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 their heads. It's exact, exactly the point. They are saying, I am not that which makes me this which gives way to being this. Ready? I am better than that. This is where the egoistic serpent consumes itself with religion. My religion is the truth. My view of God is better than the other. My view is holy. Their view is demonic or evil. Or worse, I see and they are blind. While there is a truth to some of these notions, what the death sleep does is create this dream and everything I just pointed out is the illusion or the egoistic dream. I got the truth. I'm saved. I'm a believer. I'm a Christian. Well, wait, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. You may just be a punk rocker right now. <laughs> Warring against the establishment. Or... You may be on the other side. The establishment trying to keep it, oh, keep, you know, the, the, the punk rockers away from changing it. Because that's where I identify. See, the thing is, this would only work under these conditions. And that's how the ego works. That's how the serpent works. That's how the tree of knowledge of good and evil works. But what would happen if this had happened? That if our punk rockers woke up one morning and everyone else was just like them. The ego would have a big problem because the ego or the self-centered serpent, which is comparative, has nothing else to compare itself to. This is why in Western Christianity, there is a great misconception that we can all live in a world where there's only good. If we could just eradicate evil, it'll be good. You can't. Not in the egoistic serpentile system a false Christ, if you will. You can't because the second there's just good around, guess what I'm going to wind up doing? I'm going to create an evil on purpose. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil has to have a contrast. So, back to me, myself, and I. In other words... In the sleeping heart expressed through the mind, we start with a fabricated me. I'm getting my identity from you because I'm not like you. I'm developing an identity on, really on the basis of what I'm not like, calling that good, that becomes me. And if you think about it, that's exactly what Adam and Eve did. They were the image and likeness of God, and they just said, okay, I'm now not like that. Many times, this is also assisted by our environment, our parents, our family, and community. Then there is the other, which is not like me. This is where racism, culture, religion, 
patriotism, and so on comes from. These all cannot exist without the other. They cannot exist without the, per the perceived me, which is derived from the contrast of the other. So in this state of being, I really don't see the other person, race, or people as they truly are. Let me say that again because I'm going to make a point now. In this state of being, I really don't see the other person, race, or people as they truly are. Look at this. I only see through the lens of my perceived self. I see the egoistic concept of them within myself, which is a construct I created. And then found some others to agree. The other, I really don't see them because I'm not awake. I really don't see them. I see the story I've manufactured about them in me. Yesterday, I was working on a paper for a pastor friend of mine in another state. It had to do with biblical justice and racial justice and, and how does this all work out and what are some of the thoughts. And, and that, that what was interesting is one of the questions was how did racism in, in the Christian church exist, particularly in the 18th and 19th century in America? Well, and my response was, and some of you heard this some years ago when I did Deconstructing God, I mean the entire Christian theology uh, by A.A. A. Hodge, uh, and Thornwell and the, all these guys who are the, basically the, the Protestant forces of the time, they all believed a theology that said that because Ham uncovered his father's nakedness and he was cursed, that was black people. And you know where they got it from? St. Augustine of Hippo in his book, The City of God, where he says slavery is the product of sin and it is the status of God's judgment on people. So in other words, for me to liberate the slave would be going against God's will. So now I've totally validated a point of view of, of the other. Totally validated. And think about it. There always has to be the other. And I understand it wasn't just black slavery in America. We've had all, all kinds of other oppressions that we've done and I say we've as Americans but predominantly that usually means the white guy the point is though coming back to this and I was trying to show you in a practical way the ego creates a false sense of self by contrasting it to the other and then the other gets a story of not of even really who they are gets the story I've manufactured so I can be me this is why you've heard me say so many times before I say it again. We need to be a Christ-centered people using the Bible as a tool, not a Bible-centered people hoping and assuming Christ will be in his result. I had a friend respond to me on Facebook with, with the comment that says, that's redundant. Jesus is the Bible, and if you, if you know the Bible, you know Jesus. And I was like, really? really? No. You know, the Ku Klux Klan no. reads the same Bible you do, yeah. burning crosses, calling it the light, and we know where they wind up. So don't tell me the Bible is Jesus. Don't simplify holding up the Bible. I don't have a Bible right now, but you know, as we used to do, this is the word of God. Well, wait, 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 wait. No, this is the word I interpret through the lens I have on the basis of whether or not I'm awake in God. Because I'm going to read the Bible through that same false self lens. That same false self lens construct that I have and even use scriptures to validate my point of view. This would be the serpent in the tree at its strongest. So back to me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity. In contrast, 
if for some reason there isn't the infamous other, the ego, the self-centered serpent, will create one. The ego must have the other. There must be a devil, a demon, an enemy, sin, a contrast, a darkness, and so on. If there isn't, I can't be right or righteous, holy, true, moral, and good. I can't be the me I've created. Which, of course, then seeks a tribe to agree with it, and validate the illusion, so now we've created the superior us. It is our us that it either going to be, well, let's put it this way, would be nice. We got to save them from being them because they need to be like us. We are the Christian. They are not. We are this. They are that. We are right. They are wrong. We are better. They are inferior. The ego in that form cannot live in the divine truth of who the other is because if it discovers that, it may actually discover that its own construct is false. This is why Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. It's a misconstruction in our minds that Jesus is a God of war. He's got to come back with vengeance and wage war. You have to realize, even in some of these verses, what is the context really saying? I just read to you from the, the Aramaic. It says when he returns, he's going to be dancing from every tribe. How did that happen? Well, what about the morning? Or the hitting of oneself, literally, in, in the Greek text there. You know, what, you know, you hit yourself when you mourn, that kind of idea. What about that? Well, if there's a mourning, it's only going to be because we realize, oh, my gosh, we've been killing the Christ when he showed up 2,000 years ago, and I've been doing it myself with my own ego every single day. Keep in mind, the word for peace in the New Testament is irene. And irene, interestingly enough, means to be at one with. In the tree of knowledge of good and evil reality, there is only duality. There is only an us and there is a them. This is why the egoistic notion of good and evil equals death in God's economy. Think of it. Think of this. Think of this. When you love yourself or dislike yourself, who is that that's doing the loving and disliking? Now think of it. When you think of yourself worthy or unworthy, who is thinking about that self? Let me go back and say it again. When you love yourself or dislike yourself, who is it that's doing the loving or disliking of that self? I'm trying to push you to something. The chances are the thing that you've been thinking is you all this time isn't. When I think of myself as worthy or unworthy, who is thinking about that self? While it's a good thing to so-called love yourself, there is still a duality is the point. There's still a serpentine good and evil, a duality that is still in play, which is reaching into the loving and disliking. There's still an internal other. May need to rewind that and listen to it again. This ultimately is not Christ or the tree of life. In other words, there is you and the self that has been created by you, and that's the one that most of the time decides, I don't like this or I like this, irrespective of what's the true self in the picture.
In other words, there is you and the self that's been created by you that you either love or dislike. In the lower state of thought and feeling, it manifests also as the loving or disliking of the other. Did you understand what I just said? Okay, first of all, I have this dynamic of I, the, I either love myself or I dislike myself. But then that gets translated down to whether or not I love or like them. Do I dislike them or do I love them? You see, because in order for me to love or like myself, chances are I got to have something out there I don't like. You say, well, this is okay. My brain, I just want to know if Jesus loves me today. My point is, is, that's nice. He does. But that's still external. This is about awakening to what Paul calls Jesus Christ in you. Let me read this verse to you. You are from below, Jesus says. I am from above. You are of this world, but I am not of this world. This is why I told you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. Think this through. They're hearing. You're from there. I'm from here. You're of that world. I'm not of that world. I'm from someplace else. Okay, so far so good. But that's why I told you you will die in your sins. Well, now we're talking about moral sins and stuff. Well, the Ten Commandments are different things that are breaking. Unless you believe that I am. What? Now, for unfortunately, some translations even add the word after am, he, which does not exist in the text. For unless you believe that I am he, which now becomes still the external belief rather than the internal I am. Sin, by definition, is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and that egoistic thing, the big I between the S and the N. You're, in other words, you will die in that egoistic state unless you believe the I am. And all Jesus has really come to do is show you who you are Amen. by being who he is. Remember, he's not an example for us. He's an example of us. So in the lower state of thought and feeling, it manifests also in the loving or disliking of the other. It's a lot easier for the ego to calculate the loving or disliking of the other than it is for the loving or disliking of itself. So I decide this kind of people I don't like. The, these, I mean, they're, in some in the countries of the world, they will riot over whether or not a certain football team wins. We do the same thing with, with rock bands. Oh, man, I don't like that band. That band, they're just a bunch of phonies. Whatever it is. You know, we do this because we're trying to grab something egoistically in ourselves. So Jesus said it that way. You are from below. I'm from above. You're of this world. I'm not of this world, right? He does all that. The so-called lower forms of life do not have this difficulty. I'm talking about now below human. Think about it. The rock, the tree, the flower, the antelope, or even the wolf, those lower forms, yes, is a form of egoism, but they don't have a problem with loving or disliking themselves. The antelope doesn't wake up one morning and think, Man, I hate myself. I wish I was like an elephant so those wolves wouldn't bother me. Wow. And you may think, well, they're lower forms of life. Therefore, they're not capable of that. Well, then think about this. What a paradox this, this is. They are being who they are, and we are, the so-called higher developed being, are the ones who are conflicted. The animal or plant doesn't have a problem with self-esteem. So, in waking up, <laughs> the point where true awakening occurs, inner resurrection, Christ-likeness, is when we realize that we have been identifying with thoughts, thus egoistic images or forms that are not real. 
whether our view of us or our view of the other most likely is not real. As the Apostle Paul defines in Romans, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We've put this within the tree of knowledge of good and evil context and saw that with moralism. The world is evil. Mm, those immoral people. Then we go down the list of their immoralities. What it all comes down to is, they're not a joyous Christian like me. Thank you, Jesus. Worship you. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Those miserable sinners. Thank you, Jesus. You love me. You love me, which really means you don't love them. You don't love them. But I'm going to save them so you can love them because you don't. But you do, you don't, you don't. I mean, we tell them that you love them, that you died for them and stuff, but actually we know how this is going to end for them, don't we? Think, think of how, think of, This all has to do with concepts we've created in our minds, Romans 12, 2, about who we are. Remember earlier what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 about awakening to the inner reality of the living Christ within you. You see, because, let me jump ahead. Having the mind of Christ is realizing that the you that you created is what you need to let go of, and then you become him when now you become Christ. Who you always were from the beginning. You know, some people talk about the second coming of Jesus. We're going to have a discussion about that. I'm not against that. But I think what's more important is the second coming of Christ after the resurrection. Do you know when that happened? When he entered you. Yeah. Or actually, you realized right. you were always in that space to begin with. Adam and Eve didn't lose anything they had in the garden except in their thinking. Though we may not as of yet be fully awakened to what the mind of Christ is, we may be experiencing the transformation, the emerging that our thoughts are self-centered fabrications and there is a greater I am who changes the perspective about everything. So how do you end this for today? It's rough, but I'm going to give you a verse to me that kind of is a mind bender, but it kind of makes the point. It's in Psalms 139, 11 through 12. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me becomes night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. <laughs> you see, in a non-dual world, darkness and light don't exist. Definitely not in the same frame that we've been putting them. Because then we shall see them as they truly are. Right, it's kind of fast forwarding to that famous verse in John, 1 John, where it talks about when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We've talked about that before. Well, here's the, the element. This oh, inner awakening is what we're after. And you're going to have to really do some maybe meditative work and really start to allowing the Holy Spirit. I didn't say the gifts of the Spirit. There's a dramatic difference between the gifts of the Spirit, which are wonderful, and true Holy Spirit reality. The one actually impacts the knowing of who you are where the other, the gifts of the Spirit, we can even manipulate and misuse and feed the egoistic self. Mm -hmm. 
Darkness and light are the same. It's a non-dualistic world. See, that's, that's why I think in the narrative the book of Genesis begins with two trees, but by the time you get to the end of the book of Revelation, there's only one tree. It's not really that the one has been destroyed and burnt up and <laughs> Really, I would have you consider that the tree of knowledge of good and evil, this alternative choice was just simply that. Because we had to have a genuine choice to be aware of ourself in God. We had to have that. The catch is, is as we grow out from that, it becomes unnecessary. You see, because in the tree of life, if you compare then to the tree of knowledge of good and evil, which would be then the tree of death, death is just simply the absence of life. It is not an equal force. So the Apostle Paul says to all of us, awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead as, as Christ gives you light. Christ will give you light as the light already exists. Again, Peter in the prison. It said the whole place was already lit, but he was asleep. Walk in the light as he is in the light. And we'll have fellowship with one another. Grasp some of those verses. Rethink them. And let's fully awake. God bless you. Love you guys on live stream. Email us, write us, uh, talk to us on Facebook. We look forward to you uh, sharing with us. And for all of us, please stand with us economically. Not only do you want to take care of the computer, but we want to go a little further in some other areas as well. God bless you. Love you much. Pastor Karen. Hi. I'm Pastor Karen of Oasis of the Valley, and I'm here with Pastor Christine and Dr. John, and we'd like to share something with you. If you don't live in the local area and you'd like to be part of our Oasis Fellowship, we've got a way to connect. We'd like to get to know you personally by video conference calls and telephone calls, and Dr. John will tell you more about how that came about. It was just a few weeks ago, in literally one week's time, I got several emails from people in different parts of the United States and even overseas who were interested in finding a church in their area that's preaching the same powerful message that we are and in the way we are that's quite unique. And unfortunately, I couldn't give them really an answer. I know of a couple of churches and friends that are, are ministering like this, but honest, there's not too many. And we are truly trying to press forward into a whole new arena in God right now. And uh, what wound up happening was that the thought occurred to me, well, we've got all this amazing technology why can't we pastor them with the video conferencing and stuff that you yeah. were talking about and minister into their life? And who knows what God will be able to do through that. With enough people, we may be able to start a church out there. Sounds good. So if you're interested, please click the link below and we'll explain more.